among the activities of this amazing and prolific Festival de la Ciencia y el Arte, el ALE, uh, sponsored, uh, organized, and I would say instigated, of course, intellectually instigated, I mean, by the Universidad Nacional uh, Autónoma de México, and which is dedicated this year to reflect on the problems of the possibilities of life uh, at the moment when life has been so harsh, threatened all around by the coronavirus and his effects. Well, today we are honored by the presence of one of the most prominent, uh, subtle, and I would say provocative thinkers, not only of Germany, but in contemporary philosophy. Uh, if we would be in Germany, I would have to address him as Professor Marcus Gabriel. And if would, but in Mexico, we have to say Dr. Marcus Gabriel. Let's leave it in Marcus Gabriel. The name sustains itself and is already one of the inevitable references of the attempts to redefine the tasks of philosophy and I would say social thinking under our condition of a rapid and now extreme rapid changing world. Uh, let me introduce you briefly, briefly uh, <clears throat> to the audience. <clears throat> uh, somebody that you in really, uh, 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 Marcus doesn't need to be introduced in Mexico. Uh, your main works, Max, have been already translated into Spanish and they are read not only by the intellectual community, but also in classrooms. Uh, I'm a historian and I can tell you, I use your books for everyday classroom at the eighth semester in the undergrads and so on. So uh, his works uh, uh, go over to so many spheres uh, that I have to tell you that Marcus Gabriel is not a think tank, is not a trademark, he's a person, he's here with us. If a philosopher can be something like a person, but Marcus, uh, welcome to Mexico through this virtual world. So let me introduce you briefly to our idioms, especially your words. He's very young, extreme, you know, but his influence is not young. I mean, he, he, he starts by 2010, 2010 more or less. He was born in 1980 in Bremagen, in Germany. He's a professor at the Institut für Philosophie in La Universidad de Bonn. And you know, many of you know his books. I, I will uh, just enumerate those who are translated into Spanish. Por qué no existe el mundo, sentido y existencia, una ontología realista, los límites de la epistemología, and of course, no soy una mente that became a bestseller here, neo existencialismo among many others. Uh, I have to say that uh, together with uh, Giorgio Agamben, Jung Sen, and many of the contemporary thinkers, he has become decisive in order to rethink what kind of world is going to emerge from this crisis. And before starting the conversation, let me only mention and acknowledge the, let's say, the managing force, I would say the intellectual forces that are behind this amazing, incredible uh, festival. First of all, Dr. Jorge Volpi, uh, he's the coordinator of a cultural exchange at the UNAM. Uh, El Maestro Juan Ayala, he's with us today. He's the director of the festival LALEF. And of course, La Maestra Pili de la Yata, she's on the terrain. So uh, Juan, why don't you start the conversation with Marcos? Thank you very much, Marcus, for being here in the Aleph Festival. It's a great honor to have you here as a, a very qualified voice to, to talk about some topics uh, around the, the, this uh, pandemic uh, situation. And I would like to uh, start with this question uh, about your text that you kindly sent, sent us for, for, for the festival. Uh, discovering state of confinement in which you suggest that there has been a reflective thinking process on the condition of people, and yet at the same time it coexists with a circumstance in which the so-called private life, life, as you mentioned in your text that you will present in the Aleph Festival, is now thrown 
into the cyberspace with a series of lurky factors and with a huge, huge risk as far as the private sphere is concerned. Isn't that type of reflection framed in a sort of collective culture or collective animosity where individuality is not fully expressed, but is made of different opinions or points of view that are collectively constructed in that digi digital network? And what is the status of that individuality if these factors offer, as I suggest in this question? Mm -hmm. Well, I think of um, the, the info or cybersphere as a form of um, machine to produce dissent, many perspectives, but without instruments to translate dissent into mechanisms of consent, right? So think of democracy as a political regime uh, in light of just that idea, right? So how can we manage to ground the multi-perspective uh, character, multi-perspectival character, of complex societies, right? How can we ground that in relations to objects? Because if we don't have relations to objects, non-digital objects in particular, we have no access to the facts, right? So it's not a coincidence that we're witnessing, you know, fake news and post-truth and a digital form of very vulgar postmodernism as a consequence of the ontology of social networks. Huh? So, you know, there's no court on Facebook. If we run into a problem, right, so we have two perspectives in Facebook for whatever reason, it could be any kind of political, economic, personal, aesthetic perspectives, right? There's no manager, no court that we can appeal to in order to solve our problem. And what is more important, the internet does not refer to anything outside of the internet. Let me give you a very you know, obvious everyday example. You can, references on Wikipedia have to be to, uh, to something that is on the internet. Wikipedia cannot refer to things in libraries, in ordinary libraries. So the entire knowledge production of digital life, right, is cut off from the analogical world. And this gap, right, this double gap, dissent without consent uh, uh, and um, you know knowledge claims without verification this combination leads to the thorough destruction of the modern notion of the public sphere the modern notion of the public sphere which has a long history of course it goes back to the ancient greeks um, that idea right uh, consisted in creating institutions an institution gives us a way of solving our conflict. If there's no institution, right, the only way of solving conflicts is by winning a fight. And this is, this is the architecture of the social network. Twitter, for instance, by its very nature, is a form of war. It's not a coincidence that once you start answering comments on Twitter, you get into fights, right? That's not a coincidence. It's the nature of Twitter. Or as I like to say, Twitter is way worse than Donald Trump. Twitter produced someone like Trump, but Twitter is the problem, not, tw not Trump. Trump is just an idiot. So it's the architecture of the internet itself, its ontology, that, among other things, led to this crisis. This crisis wouldn't be what it is had there not been the, the, you know, the social network. And what we're doing right now, literally right now, right, is we need to retreat to a sphere that is completely transparent for the surveillance state. Uh, because, you know, like there's, uh, um, of course, no, you know, China isn't listening, they don't care, right? But they could. And the more socioeconomic transactions we move to the internet, the less will they be tied to the democratic rule of law. Otherwise put, in just one slogan, um, social networks controlled by American tech companies necessarily, not coincidentally, necessarily lead to the destruction of enlightenment. Uh, they are anti-enlightenment machines, pure obscurantism. And how could you imagine barriers, conditions that will uh, somehow limit, regulate these powers? Is this imaginable today? 
Well, it, it is imaginable in principle, right? So I think there are two questions. How can we think of, right? How can we free ourselves uh, from this kind of domination, asymmetric domination? So there's, there's an individual ethics here, but there's also, of course, the collective question, which kind of, uh, you know, regulatory institutions such as a nation state or courts, right, can fight the internet, meaning the tech monopolies uh, that are mostly located in the United States and China. So let me try to answer both questions. So on an individual level, we need to raise the awareness what we are actually doing. So I think of us as what I have called in an article in El País last year on May 1st, I think of us as digital proletarians, right? Uh, which means that we produce data. I can tell you what data are in a, in a second, how I think of them, but we produce data and uh, tech companies you, uh, use the surplus value that we create in virtue of just using their platform. So any second that we spend on Zoom, Skype, or any other digital medium me, uh, can be translated into dollars in someone's pocket. Now, do we get the recommend, recompensation for this? Not at all, right? So we should get, uh, uh, you know, at the very least, I think, that these companies owe us a lot of money yeah? um, because, you know, they use our data. I'm working for them. I don't have a salary. I don't even have the minimal salary that would be guaranteed to me in Germany. I'm in Germany. I'm working right now, not just for UNAM, which is a pleasure, but I'm also working for Zoom. Now, Zoom doesn't give me anything for the work that I'm doing for Zoom. This is the most brutal form of exploitation that is possible. And, uh, and it only works because the individuals are not aware of this, right? You don't feel this. It feels like you're exercising your freedom. Uh, so it's, it's a it feels like form. you're using a service to, it feels like that. Yes, very much. It feels like, you know, like a, a it's a an exchange, a ima imaginary exchange, no? Yes, exactly. It feels like using the telephone in the 80s, but you don't have to pay for it, right? Exactly, so it yeah. feels like a lot of freedom. Yeah. Huh? yeah. Uh, um, but this is part of the design. So the production of the feeling of freedom goes into the design, right? Uh, if you travel to the United States, you know, this is very different for different people, of course. If you come from Afghanistan, you will feel differently. But many people, if they travel to the United States or even try to, like, move to the United States, they feel very free as soon as they enter the country, right? Which is a brutal illusion. At the border, in particular in airports, you have all these, you know, ideological shows, the movies, the sound, the colors, right? So the, uh, something that is actually extremely oppressive, border police, feels like an entry point to a new kind of freedom. Uh, so this is just, uh, you know, American soft power, which, you know, it always feels free, but it's domination. Um, um, so th this raises then the strategic question, um, how can we possibly organize systems of regulation? We are doing something like this here in Germany, together with the state of North Rhine Westphalia, right? So it's the, it's the biggest state in Germany, the most populated state uh, with 22 million people. And, uh, uh, and it used to be the, the number one industrial state in Germany. Industrialization happened, uh, you know, like in, roughly in this part of Germany, in Germany, uh, the so-called Ruhrgebiet, uh, which is pretty close uh, from here. And we are running an AI certificate program now with the state government, which then will go federal and uh, to the European level. And our idea is that you need an, a, a certificate in the future in order to sell uh, products based on artificial intelligence. And our catalog of criteria for this certificate process would never allow Facebook to be created in the first place. But I think we should take more extreme measures. If you ask me my recommendation, uh, the European Union should immediately shut down the entire American internet like China did or Russia or Turkey, right? Turkey can always do it. Shut it down and rebuild a new network, which, which is possible, right? France has just nationalized Air France. Why don't we nationalize the, the servers, right? Uh, this is no problem. We're in a kind of war scenario right here, right? Uh, meaning we're in, you know, in, in a state of exception to be more precise. And in the state of exception, it wouldn't be, you know, it would be legally completely unproblematic 
to nationalize servers and recreate the internet. I and think trans you know, transforming internet into a public service then. Absolutely. It's a public matter. I mean. Yes. yes. So not into a private uh, yeah. issue, right? Exactly, like infrastructure, right? right. So like I don't uh, want railroads, like uh, subways, like uh, all these things, right? Exactly, like railroads. Uh, you know, this is critical infrastructure. So why would why would a foreign power, the United States of America, right, represented by mega tech companies, how do they run our infrastructure? You know, like how is this a good That's idea? Great. Yeah. Europe is being colonized now. <laughs> of course, of course, yeah, no doubt, yeah, definitely yeah. Uh, in various ways. Europe, uh, Europe is being colonized both by the United States of America in a fairly brutal war, right, uh, uh, economic war. Donald Trump has explicitly called the European Union an enemy, right, and by China. Uh, uh, um, so, you know, like it's absolutely time to face up to those facts. You also, uh, Marcus, uh, has in, in your in your text uh, some refer uh, some refers to the three things of uh, liberal democracy as a the global di digital life, but there's also some advantages for liberal democracy in this kind of uh, of a new universe, digital universe, uh, in which. Uh, it could succeed many of its process of construction of opinion and consensus building of uh, social groups in these uh, same mutual networks. So how would you say the, the advantages and the, and the threatenings of the democracy and the liberal in this context? Well, I think that, uh, you know, the, the architecture, the digital ar architecture as it is right now, right, is, just a, uh, is going to be just an erosion of liberal democracy. So I see zero hope, zero, right, for this liberatory, uh, emancipatory conception of the internet. Um, so we all know, which has been studied also by psychologists, etc. we all know from our own experience with the internet that, uh, you know, the way we remember uh, digital events is very different from the way we remember, right, events that are not virtual. There's a very good reason why academic life involves like dinners and, you know, mezcal and uh, good food and so forth, right, after conferences. There's a reason for this because, you know, we memorize the information in a completely different way. So uh, um, be, precisely because we are animals, among other things, on the, just on that level. Yeah? So what happens if we're online is we think we are like very socially active and so forth, but nothing happens. The French Revolution couldn't have happened on the internet, right? This is one of the reasons why the Arab Spring failed, because it was triggered by Facebook. Yeah. Um, these things are not sustainable, right? Your mental life is just very different, right? Just think of the difference between being able to watch all movies online and going to a, to a cinema, right? So this is a completely different experience. Bigger screen, you're together with other people and so forth. And what we're witnessing right now is the impossibility of protest. Yeah? So many people feel uncomfortable uh, uh, about the state of exception, and they have critical questions concerning uh, the measures that were taken by basically every single government on the planet. But there's no, you know, you cannot really protest or just analyze the situation. All you can do is go online. This is one of the reasons why in Germany right now, we're seeing a, a rise in conspiracy theories in the last week, precisely because people cannot go to the restaurant, right, uh, and talk to some other person who will clear up their mind. Yeah? Um, and I think there are more and more effects of this type. So the whole psychology of being online is just so different from the psychology of, of being offline that I think none of the relevant processes of emancipation can happen online. Just think about sexual liberation, right? If people cannot have sex, they are not going to have a sexual liberation, right? So we wouldn't have. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So uh, uh, and 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 similarly for all the big processes of modernity, yeah, the good things of modernity, none of them happened online. Going back to the coron coronalization uh, era, how would you the, that famous? 
hygienismo, which is hygienism in English, operate in the post-pandemic era, uh, in which it occurs a kind of sanitary dictatorship in the new societies that are likely to bring a series of absurd questions and others not so absurd that will generate many elements of confinement in public life or health reserve. reserve such as being encapsulated in a restaurant or having cancer problems with only a third of the room occupied, or this kind of concerts that we mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, so how much will that affect life in society as we know, uh, as we know now? And how much does it violate the human rights or any country's citizen uh, dry, uh, rights? Let, uh, me yeah. add, let me add a little uh, uh, some to this question, Marcus. Aren't you too optimistic by talking about post-viral, post-coronial society? Don't you think that what you very clear define as the biological imperative is here to stay? I would like to add this question. Maybe you're a little bit too optimistic. Yeah, that's a great uh, question. I didn't uh, hear this one yet. Yeah, that's a very good one too. Um, so uh, let me start with uh, uh, Juan's uh, uh, question and then you know come to this crucial uh, point about whether I might even be still too optimistic. Um, um, so uh, um, uh, so hygienism, you know, think of it like racism. Huh? And uh, when I say you know post-colonial, I intend this to hear like post-colonial too, right? So you know, can we move to a post-colonial phase? is as difficult as the question, can we move to a post-coronial phase? Yeah? And they're actually very similar, if you think about this, right? The dialectics uh, uh, resemble each other in a remarkable way. So um, the, the uh, human dignity means that you think of the other as a human being. Yeah? So the, the basic basis of any kind of real ethics is the assumption of full symmetry or neutrality. Yeah? So the other is as relevant as you. This is why ethics is not altruism, nor is it egoism, right? It's neutral with respect to both. In an ethical consideration, it doesn't matter who you are, right? And who the other is. You just think of the other as an instantiation of the universal form of a free self-determining animal. Yeah? So, uh, and then there is just no difference at all. It's, then it's just obvious that there's no difference between an indigenous person in Mexico, right? Uh, you know, a, a woman or a, a transgender person in India, right? And the prime minister of Japan. Yeah? From, from that perspective, the ethical perspective, it doesn't matter who they are, right? So when you, when you think of them from an ethical standpoint. And uh, hygienism undermines this ethical consideration in the name of ethics. It tells you that we need to protect the weak and so forth because of this health imperative, which is correct, but it does so under the wrong premises uh, by turning us into points in computer simulations. All the epidemiological models, in particular the model which led to the current lockdown situation worldwide, namely the one created by Imperial College. I like that, right? I mean, Imperial yeah. College in London, Imperial College, right? Forced <laughs> all of us into lockdown with a single computer simulation, which is based on terrible data. Yeah? This, is, this is a fact about something which happened about two months ago. And uh, if you look at those models, these computer simulations, they represent humans as just points, right? And if a point hits another point too often, then there's an inf infection, right? So you think of yourself as moving through an abstract, abstract space defined by the probability of, a, of the spread of an unknown virus. Huh? So if this is your conception of the social, then you don't have a conception of the social. You don't understand the world huh? be because you completely misrepresent it. So the, the, such a computer simulation can be very useful uh, you know, for health services. I'm not denying that. Yeah? But we are not health specialists. So if you present everybody with these models, then of course everybody will be paranoid. You know, this is just a basic truth of psychoanalysis. We will see all these like crazy people just constantly washing their hands, right? 
Today in Germany, there has been like even recommendations by other health experts, right, that tell us how to use like certain creams so that we don't destroy our hands with all the washing. Yeah? Um, so this is like a psychoanalytic nightmare. <laughs> Uh, um, so this is, uh, this is hygienism. Now the question is, right, can we ever overcome hygienism? If hygienism is with us to stay, then we will enter a soft dictatorship where everyone just thinks that the imperative of life is just to be around for as long as possible. But that's not the meaning of life, right? The goal of life is not to be around. The goal of life is to be around in order to do the right things. They can involve, uh, and the right things of a human life involve a lot of dirty things, right? I mean, if you're a hygienist, you can never have sex. You cannot drink wine, beer, or mezcal, right? You cannot travel, because if you go to like any other place to which you're not adapted as an animal, there will be viruses and bacteria, right? I could never leave Bonn ever again if hygienism wins, because I'm only, or probably only my house, right? Because you know, I share bacteria and viruses with my family, and we should never meet another family, too dangerous, right? So if you think all of this through, then this is where it will lead. Yeah, yeah. there's a point in your argument, which is for me fundamental. You say, you state that the idea of a virus-free society is absurd, it's a completely dystopia, yeah. but the whole uh, structure now of political epidemiology, like political economy in the 19th century, is based on the idea, I can feel that when I listen to these scientists, they are expecting yeah. really a virus-free society. This is madness. But this is madness yeah. in the center of political power. So my yeah. doubt is that if we don't have a new marriage, marriage, between the power of states and uh, the biological imperative. Because we can have a new virus next year. You can see it now. Uh, just uh, two people infected in Korea, they are calling back uh, all the things. Uh, they are taking measures. The, the, the fear is back. That, that's a question. I think yeah. it's very, a very good stand. How do we get free of the idea of a virus reset time? No? Yeah. Yes, that's the question. And I think the only solution is uh, what I have called a new enlightenment. So uh, I think, you know, like in my work, I have analyzed, I've been following a certain intellectual virus, you know, which I call naturalism. Naturalism is the idea that the human being, you know, uh, uh, can be deciphered completely by natural scientific technological research. And there were like uh, three waves so far. And now we see the most dangerous wave. Wave number one was physics, you know, 18th century in particular. Um, uh, uh, people thought that, you know, we can figure out the entire universe and then it's going to be a kind of deterministic machine. Yeah? Uh, it, it turns out that this just didn't work out, right? So physicalism failed. Number two was neuroscience, right? They said, then they said, oh, let's use neuroscience, right? And then we figure out the human being. This also failed. Then artificial intelligence, which was the last decade. From 2010 to 2020, we saw uh, AI research, right? Replace the human being, transhumanism, posthumanism. This also completely failed because our machines are still completely idiotic, right? There is zero artificial intelligence. It's just a myth. And now the next step, the most dangerous step, which comes as a huge surprise to me, is that medicine, right, in particular virology, not even all of medicine, right, uh, because hygiene experts and immunologists will, will tell you very different things from the virologists and epidemiologists, right? And I, I, I talk to like a bunch of very good epidemiologists who are also philosophical logicians, and they tell me that epidemiology is a kind of pseudoscience like neoliberal economics. It's uh, apparently in pretty bad shape as a scientific discipline. And uh, there have been, you know, like pretty good critics of epidemiology in the field itself, in Stanford and elsewhere. And now this discipline is indeed taking over. And so if we, if we want to get out of this crisis and the worst crisis that will come after this, we finally need to, you know, return to the notion 
of the human being as a fundamentally free intellectual historical agent. Nothing less will solve this problem. And this means uh, accepting what the German Council for Ethics recently in, a, in an important letter to the government has called the risk of life. Yeah? And fortunately, our politicians are hearing the message. The second man in the state, Wolfgang Schäuble, he's technically the second in the order of power uh, after the president. He gave a famous interview a couple of weeks ago, ago where he said that the protection of life is not the highest duty of democracy. So we see some, yeah, yeah, we see a, a backlash here and a real discussion in Germany, including sociologists, philosophers, and so forth. Yeah. But this is an exception, right? Yeah, I think, I, yeah, I can imagine that he meant that because of the situation of the economy and so on. That was, yeah. was, that if was the we reason. should prefer yeah. to reopen and yeah. risk a new pandemic in this debate. You also yeah. wrote about this issue in a very interesting way. Uh, what you say is that uh, governments just throw themselves into a situation that they even, even they don't know them. Uh, now you have 25 million uh, uh, unemployed people in the States, yeah. in Europe, figures are going out and they are trying to uh, gather all kinds of monies and so on, not to see if they could go through this situation. But what you said is something very interesting that uh, uh, what would make sense is to do all what we are doing today with the economy and society and so on in such a way that we don't return to something that we can call with your concept the pre-coronial society pre-coronial if there is a post-coronial there should be a pre-coronial no yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I think so no it would be yeah. like so uh, is it possible? Because what I see is that the machinery is perfectly convinced that they can go to the pre-coronial situation. With yes, that's, that's what many people still believe, um, and, or at least hope, right? But, you know, I'm quite certain that this is not going to happen. Um, for one thing, the pre-coronial society is a ruin. It's destroyed. It's just not there anymore, right? The money is spent. Germany saved in the last decade in an unheard of, uh, you know, like economic growth in German history, recent history, saved about a trillion euros, which we have just spent, right? The, the, all our savings are gone. There's nothing there, right? In, in two months, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in two months. Yeah. Well, uh, so the savings, the, the state savings of, uh, you know, like 10 years, and they were significant, right? Uh, Germany was incredibly rich without us knowing, right? We now see how rich we were, right? <laughs> uh, um, so the German government, there's a thing, you know, in the German welfare state, uh, you know, uh, everyone who, uh, you know, runs the, almost everyone who runs the risk of being unemployed receives 80%, up to 87% if they have a family, of their salary from the government. It's not unemployment money, it's just salary. So that companies don't have to let people go. This is how we protect ourselves against, the, uh, you know, the US situation. And this is all coming from this money. Um, so Germany has spent everything. There's, you know, the pre-coronial stuff. It's just, it's as if we had like a huge, you know, mountain of gold, right? And we just threw it away. The mountain of evaporated. gold. It evaporated. Yeah, it's just <laughs> evaporated. None of this is there anymore, right? And even worse in the United States or in England, nothing is there, right? So the pre-coronial society is just destroyed in two months because the, and the situation was incredibly unstable. And also, I think no one wants to return. If I talk to people here in Germany, right, I think there's going to be the psychological effect that people think they want to return to burn out capitalism. And once they get the opportunity, they can't. There's going to be a psychological barrier, right? So then they're like, but it was kind of nice to be with my family. I hate this traveling. I don't want to go back to all those planes. Mass and yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, uh, you don't want to be on one of those boats, right? Uh, uh, um, so uh, uh, I think that it's psychologically and economically impossible to return to the pre-coronial society, which means that we better prepare ourselves, uh, you know, for a good entry point into the next stage of human development. It all depends on the dynamics of the movement then the movement will take off, right? Now we can shape the dynamics. 
Uh, and philosophy plays a crucial role in this. We are in a similar situation, you know, to that of Plato. You know, Plato comes basically right after the plague in Athens, which killed Pericles, right? There was this plague. And then suddenly Plato and Aristotle are there and they're shaping the future for 2000 years, right? We're in this kind of scenario. This is absolutely not a trivial scenario, as many people believe, right? Um, uh, I can give you like some bit of sociological evidence. Germany is now reopening. In my city, restaurants are open. You know, fitness centers, will, sports studios will open next Monday. Even sauna, the sauna will be open oh, oh, oh. in three weeks. That's a, <laughs> and, uh, but no one wants to go there, right? Today we discussed at home, should we go to a restaurant? But, you know, as, you need to wear a mask. Only at the table can you take off your mask. And the waiters wear masks. It's just no fun. No one wants to go to the restaurant. Uh, and, the, 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 you know, the shopping malls are open in, in, in my state. No one is going there because people are wearing masks. It's just terrible to be in a shopping center. And I think that we will see similar scenarios, right? So mm. um, uh, um, there will be this attempt. Let's just go back. And then everyone realizes there is no back. Plus, the, the, the EU doesn't want us to go back. They have different plans. And nevertheless, well, let, me, let me introduce one historical perspective in this thing. Okay. If you look at the pandemias, epidemics, during the 16th century, not before, because we don't know very much about them, uh, Black Peace and so on, 17th century, uh, we have enough data about them today. Yeah. Uh, there is a period like like today almost. I mean, there are the Lazaretos already, 16th century, where people were detained before entering Venice, entering Paris. People knew already about social distance. You remember this figure of the 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 doctor already as, as yeah, a yeah. bird with with the shake in order to keep the distance. They they knew a lot of things that they 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 did a lot of things that we're doing today. But uh, historians have not studied something that this crisis brought to us. At least for historians, we have new issues. And this is the folly. Okay, if, if, if uh, contacts, contact in the same of tactus, of tactus, of uh, uh, tacting each other and so stops sex and so on, uh, stopped also at that time uh, for one year, for one year. The, at that time was, was a moment where this kind of contact society uh, restarted after, I don't know, we don't know, after five years, 10 years, where confidence was uh, won again. Confidence in a risk society, not in a non-risk society, right? Yeah. So what we see in the 16th century is that life stops, a little bit like today, but after five, 10 years, everything comes again to, to the some kind of same habits is not going to happen this i mean are we not rushing too much it's only two months i don't know if you understand the question yeah, yes definitely but i think that um uh, um those responsible for the lockdowns meaning mostly governments of nation states right are fully aware of the climate crisis which is way worse than the coronavirus mm -hmm. Right. So I think, you know, for Europe, it's pretty clear that uh, the goal is uh, of, you know, Ursula von der Leyen as the head of the European Union, clearly Germany, France, and many other big uh, economies. The goal is now the new Green Deal for the European Union. If you watch the news in Germany every night, they give you the Corona numbers and then some initiatives for a more sustainable economy. Yeah. So the, the German plan is very clearly to come up with like a, a, you know, what I have called the monetarization of the morally good, right? So transform morally guided action into a motor for economic growth. That is going to be the German model yeah? um, because this has paid off, right? The Germans are the good guys this time. Right? <laughs> <laughs> finally, uh, finally. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, even on a strategic level, right, if you're the good guys, uh, the Americans are now very clearly not the good guys anymore. They never really were, but now it's evident, right? They completely gave up on the notion of their democratic soft power. Yeah? Everyone thinks of them as just an 
you know, like evil, aggressive bunch of idiots, right? This is how it looks. And uh, because of, you know, their symbolic uh, politics and the actual politics. And uh, what the European Union is trying to do in the geopolitical situation, you know, vis-a-vis -vis China and the US in particular, is trying to become a moral compass of humanity. Uh, 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 that's, you know, uh, you will see this in every single declaration of government, right? Uh, ethics, rule of law, you know, it's in all the documents, the AI strategy of the European Union, the ecological strategy. So I think that the EU is using the lockdown situation in order to thoroughly rebuild our economy. You know, uh, France has nationalized Air France, Italy has nationalized Air Italia. They have destroyed all the cheap, uh, you know, uh, uh, aviation companies. We will see more and more of this. That's, um, that's my hope. And so uh, so what, what you are saying is that the coronavirus crisis could play a role like little bit uh, 29 in the sense that it puts the question the question for a kind of new deal a new deal 21st century type not the the third that's what you're saying more yes. or less that but is it opens opens yeah. a completely new horizont uh, to live off the pre-coronial neoliberal society and so on yes that's that's, that's, that's your assumption that is, the that is the German plan. Uh, okay. So yeah. this is not just an interpretation. Yeah, this, is yeah. this, is, this, this is what you will hear on the news from every single minister. The Minister of Economic Affairs, Finance, the, you know, the Chancellor Angela Merkel herself. This is what they say, the president. Uh, uh, they all say, right, even Macron, right, has put an end to neoliberalism explicitly. He said, we cannot leave everything to the markets. Macron. Uh, uh, so uh, I think that this is basically really, you know, that is the plan for solving the pandemic crisis in the European Union. Uh, um, uh, you know, th th this is what I get to also like when I talk to politicians here, you know, like one of the real candidates for the next, you know, chancellor in Germany is the governor of my state, Armin Laschet from the Christian Democrats, an incredibly reasonable uh, person. We have a lot, you know, it's surprising how many reasonable politicians we have right now. Right? But he has been like publishing articles about how we need like a multidisciplinary uh, uh, research team in order to build a better future. And they really mean it uh, because, you know, they know, they just know that for strategic reasons, right? I'm not saying they're saints, right? I'm not portraying them as Gandhi or Jesus, right? They are they're politicians. politicians. <laughs> they are politicians. Uh, but I think that there's a very good geopolitical reason why the European Union will try to go for the model of ethical life, to use Hegel's formula, Sittlichkeit, um, because this is the best way to fight both China and the US. It's what they call European values. I think it's a mistake to think of them as European values. We need universal values, right? You guys need to be on board. This is not about us. If it's about us, this, it's not ethical. It's right? about the world. It's about the exactly. world. Yeah. Uh, no, but ju just one question uh, adding to that. Like in 29, there are at least two ways, two possible outcomes. 29, you have the Roosevelt thing and so on. It went more or less without losing all the democratic values. But you have also the, the European situation, fascism and so on. You, you talk about the possibilities of a new kind of political power. You even use the name dictatorship, viral dictatorship and so on. Uh, it can go also this way I, I, I'm fearing about the U.S., China, not to say Latin America. Let's see what happens. It, it, uh, it, uh, I don't know if you understand. It can go the, the, the wrong way, okay? Yes. Not the German European. Yes. Why don't you talk a little bit about this outcome that you also foresee in, in, your, in your writings? Yes, I think that, um, um, you know, uh, uh, if Donald Trump gets reelected, they are gone. Forget about them, right? Uh, we can only hope that they won't attack anyone or whatever, right? If Donald Trump gets reelected, we, we can just pray that we are safe, right? Uh, but they're out of the picture then, right? That's, um, uh, and, uh, 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 and China is already uh, the most, uh, uh, you know, successful dictatorship in history. And it, you know, like, uh, and uh, Xi Jinping is the most powerful dictator of modernity, 
right. yeah, we completely underestimate this, right? Compared to Xi Jinping, Mao Zedong is, a, is like a, a beginner. Yeah? Uh, 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 Just a baby dictator. Yeah. Yeah, the baby dictator, right? <laughs> so we're, we're dealing, you know, with the, the, the most powerful dictator in history, in, in absolute terms, right? 1.3 billion people, a tech, a super high technology, incredible networks of production, uh, uh, and just indefinite amount of power, right? Uh, no end of term, nothing. The most powerful dictator. Uh, uh, so no, in both ways. But let me ask you something about Europe. There is a Europe, a new, a new right, uh, and it's growing. It's growing. Vox in Spain, Le Pen in France. Yeah. What's going to happen with the right and this uh, viral crisis, crisis, this coronavirus? Is yeah. it grow? Is it, what, what's going to happen with that? Because it's always a little bit, it's not dangerous, but it, it's, it's something that is there. It's a press. Yes. yes. So I think. It will, in Germany and so on. Yes. I think it will depend uh, on uh, the various uh, national situations, unfortunately, uh, before the European Union can come together, which uh, needs to happen. Um, Take the German, let me compare the German, Spanish, French, and Italian in particular. Uh, um, other places have very different dynamics too. Uh, but like at, at, the, uh, you know, at the geological core uh, of the European Union, continental Europe. Um, so in Germany, what happened in the crisis is that the, uh, uh, the, the right-wing populace lost uh, you know, about five or six percent. They were around 15 percent, say if I recall correctly, and now they're more like 8%. And this all went, most of it went to the Christian Democrats. Remarkably, also the Green, lost, Green Party, which is huge in Germany, uh, lost a couple of percent uh, to the Social Democrats. So what we're seeing in Germany, actually, in the crisis, is that they lose uh, rapidly. Yeah? What they're trying to do right now is organize conspiracy th theory-driven uh, demonstrations. Yeah? This is happening, this is a new phenomenon in the last days, yeah, where thousands of people meet in Berlin, Stuttgart, Munich, and other places uh, to protest against, you know, Bill Gates, Jewish world conspiracy, and shit like that, right? So, uh, um, but so far, this doesn't help them. Yeah? So they have been marginalized. And uh, as a matter of fact, there have been, you know, like uh, razzias against them by the government in the corona crisis. Yeah. Uh, so the government is heavily fighting them in Germany and keeping them under control for the time being, better than before. So that's working very well. Um, but I, Italy is a nightmare, yeah, for instance. I talked to like a bunch of journals. I, I did not even authorize the publication of my interviews uh, because it's completely destroyed political rational life, right? Uh, um, uh, I, I even heard that, uh, you know, uh, more Italians would trust Xi Jinping than yeah. Angela Merkel, right? They think of China as their friend and Germany as their enemy. I've noticed this as a person traveling to Italy in the last couple of years, right? Uh, they started attacking German visitors, wow. right? Symbolically, yeah, certain restaurants where they told you they had, don't have a space, but I speak Italian, so I knew what they were talking about, right? So, um, okay. so there's clearly, uh, uh, you know, Italy is a very serious problem, yeah. and uh, 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 because there, are, you know, you have a majority, you know, like more than half of the Italians, yeah. you know, are populist. It's basically, you know, not to mention Poland or Hungary. Right. Yeah? Uh, so there are these serious problems. And Macron is also in an incredibly unstable uh, position, which is why he needs to declare such a brutal state of exception. Uh, uh, and Spain is particularly brutal. Uh, um, with so, Vox growing now, no? Yeah, Vox is yeah. really dangerous. No? Yeah. So there, there are these dangers, right? Uh, I think Germany is doing you know, just fine right now. Um, mm. But it's unclear if this is you know, like enough. I mean, you can't have just a you know, one functioning nation state together with, like, you know, Sweden and Norway, that's not a sustainable environment. Yeah. Unless you reduce the European Union to these three nations. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, um, and maybe we will see more fragmentation. It will depend on whether this new enlightenment will catch on, right? It's up to us. We are historical agents, right? Yeah. This is, uh, uh, processes are not automated. It depends on if we spread the good word, 
right? Which is not the Bible, but just moral insight, right? If we spread moral insight, we can win this. Yeah? You know, uh, 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 this is how I think about this, right? We are in a fight for the morally good. This is, you know, like, uh, uh, this just is history, right? Uh, history has clearly returned. Uh, I don't think it ever ended. Fuku you know, Fukuyama was completely wrong. But now yeah. we know that history is back in full gear. I, I have some question about this, uh, this article of Virtual Han uh, on El País, a newspaper, that we suggest that the East and West has different, completely different approach to, 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 the, to facing the pandemic. So what's your thoughts about this kind of uh, differences between uh, both hemispheres to, well, you, you were very clear about the, how Germans are doing right now, but uh, there's some, uh, some uh, special taste of uh, Asian or, or, or the East part of the world that is facing successfully probably this, this, uh, this pandemic. And also probably they are uh, getting to a stronger capitalism as well. So uh, th there's not so uh, difference between the way they are making money, and I think that they they are making a lot of money with this uh, with this um, issue. So how do you uh, receive this uh, the usual Hans article or these suggestions of Western? Yes, I think that Byung Chul Han is an Orientalist, right? And I mean this. I agree a, completely uh, with you. Uh, uh, completely. Uh, completely. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it's a prey for the Orient again, no? Yes, we, uh, you cannot do it, Europeans. Look at your situation and so on. Yeah. Exactly. I agree so, completely. It's the revenge of China. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. He's like a Chinese spy. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, um, so you know, he, I agree he, completely with you. You know, he just buys Chinese propaganda, right? Uh, about a, a decade ago, you know, I was in Hong Kong, had a great time. I met my wife there, wonderful experience, and it all looked like very fancy. And so they told me, which was Chinese propaganda, oh, Hong Kong is nothing. You need to see the mainland, right? Oh. So I thought that all the mainland must be so beautiful and so forth. So I really started learning Chinese in San Francisco afterwards uh, uh, and so forth. And I went to Beijing with full hope. And I came there and it was one of the worst shitholes I've ever seen. And, <laughs> and, uh, right? Byung Chul Han just imagines, right, this, like many people, like a glorious Chinese future, etc. right? This is just a nightmarish dictatorship. You know, China is North Korea with a human face, right? right. Just, you know, you can, it's just nicer, they have food, right, and so forth. But and with I, a lot of economic power, that, that is... Exactly, that, exactly, that's, right? That's so, what makes it really fear. You know? Yes, it's a dangerous, it's an incredibly dangerous dictatorship. But mm -hmm. as far as I can tell, my assessment of the Chinese situation is that, you know, they don't want to take over the world, right? That's, uh, no. They just want to go back to the position that they have been occupying for thousands of years. That, you know, modernity, uh, uh, colonialism in particular, uh, 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 and the Japanese attack and so forth, have just interrupt, has interrupted them, right? right? And okay. they just want to return to their historical normality. That's all, right? right and right. then we're not going to see them, like the emperor. There will be a <laughs> wall, you're not going to see them. Once they're finished with us, right? They are, they are, they are out of the picture. For, for the next thousands of years. And they have this imperial uh, know-how, no? They, it's, it's there, it's there. The imperial know-how is there. Yeah. Yes, and an, and, and an incredible political philosophy. Yeah? Right. So Chinese political thinking, if you, you know, like, uh, uh, that, right. you know, is just incredible. Yeah? It's way better than Thomas Hobbes and John Locke. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, works, it works at least incredible, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I think I'm. Unfortunately, we we have not uh, much uh, more time. But uh, well, uh, I think it's it's a great pleasure to have you here, and probably we will have your your uh, your masterclass on 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 on, on the festival uh, soonly. So let's uh, try to have another opportunity to to continue because we will have in the, this Aleph. Uh, 
um, web page, uh, the, the following of the evolution of pandemic and, uh, and the, the invitation for the great voices in the world and, and uh, as, as scientists and thinkers or, and all kind of uh, people which uh, have a, a, a interesting voice in this kind of matter. So uh, it wasn't, I mean, it will not be the last time we invite you, Marcus, if you agree with that, because uh, it's very interesting, the evolution of the next few months uh, uh, on the side of the arts, on the side of the uh, knowledge, and uh, on the side of the science as well. So I don't know if you have something to the last the, question. Let me add a little bit to, to Jorge's invitation. And in the post-coronial world, we of course would like to invite you here to Mexico to no, drink a little bit no. of mezcal and uh, to teach a little bit. You are a very well-known author and extreme estimate yeah. here. Uh, and I yeah. thought, you know, like uh, the, you know, um, uh, we went on honey honeymoon in Mexico. Oh, yeah? My ah, wife, yeah. uh, my wife specializes in Mexican literature. Okay, so, so it's a very important. You know, like, uh, yeah. it's yes. just one of the most beautiful places on earth. Okay, right? the first yeah. second of post-coronial era. I'm there, one. I'm there. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, we we'll we'll invite you both, yes. Yeah, we, we, we have some uh, meeting for, for, for tech for the next year. For, yes. uh, surely yes. we will have something, uh, uh, and that will be a great place to have you here at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. So that's your home, and thank you so much, Marcus. And we will be in contact because I mean, there's so much to think about the post coronal coronial uh, age. So <laughs> I, I, we hope to, to, to count with your presence here at TUNAM and Always. ALF as well. Thank bueno, you. then we say no adios, hasta luego. Sí, hasta, hasta pronto. Yeah. Oh, sí, hasta pronto. See you soon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sí, See you soon, I'm Marcus. I'm Gracias. It was a pleasure, Marcus. It was fantastic. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. See you soon. Hasta continúen con la programación de la LEF sí. en eh, la página de internet www.culturaunam.mx diagonal el ALEF. Los esperamos. Thank mm -hmm. you.